Welcome everyone to the webinar series for November from the Center for Subsurface Energy and the Environment at the University of Texas at Austin. My name is John Olson. I'm a professor in the Hildebrand Department of Petroleum and Geosystems Engineering. The Center for Subsurface Energy and the Environment is a large group, almost 30 principal investigators working on subsurface engineering type projects that deal with energy and the environment. We cover a broad range of topics. I'm not going to go in detail on this, but we have subsurface applications um, related to oil, gas, other sustainability topics and subsurface engineering, covering many technical disciplines and engineering tools. And we have a large collection of industrial affiliate programs where uh, research is funded by largely by um, companies. Our monthly webinars are intended to be informative and industry driven um, coming from researchers and collaborators in the center. They are held every second Tuesday of each month at noon via Teams. All the webinars are uploaded to our YouTube channel shortly after completion within a few days most of the time and we already have our next two webinars scheduled in, in December. Hugh Daigle on December 12th will talk to us who's a professor in the Hildebrand Department and then Matt Ballhoff on January 9th who's also a professor in the Hildebrand Department. During today's seminar and during any of these seminars um, we accept questions through the Q&A um, portal on Teams and as the seminar goes along whenever you think of a question just go ahead and post it to Q&A and we'll we'll collect those at the end of the the seminar and the speaker will will um, answer the questions as best she can. Today we have the pleasure to host Julia Gale who um, has a PhD from structural in structural geology from Exeter University in the UK and during that particular uh, project she worked on the Archean of South Southern West Greenland. She taught structural geology and tectonics for 12, year, 12 years at the University of Derby in the UK and she moved to UT Austin in 1998 where she's a senior research scientist at the Bureau of Economic Geology and the Jackson School of Geosciences. She's currently appointed as a fellow of the Dave P. Carlton Centennial Professorship in Geology in the Jackson School and her research focuses on natural fracture characterization and prediction in shale and carbonate hydrocarbon reservoirs and on hydraulic fracture characterization in unconventional reservoirs. I also have the ple pleasure of working with Julie in research in our um, industrial affiliate program called FRAC. I think without further ado, I will pass on to, to Julia after I tell you the title of her talk, Natural and Hydraulic Fractures, Relevance for Hydrocarbon Reservoirs, Enhanced Oil Recovery and Carbon Storage Projects in Unconventional Reservoirs and for Low Enthalpy geothermal projects. Off to you, Julia. All right, well, thank you very much for inviting me um, to uh, speak in this webinar series and thank you to John for the introduction. Um, I would like to introduce my co-authors on this talk. So we have Steve Larbach, Esti Ukar, Sarah Elliott, Andras Fall and Sheng Peng from the Bureau and John Olson himself from the Hildebrand Department of Petroleum and Geosystems Engineering. So let's get going. Um, in this talk, I aim to showcase a wide variety of uh, fracture studies to demonstrate their relevance to energy production. And we're first going to examine natural fractures, and I'm going to explain a fundamental process that governs fracture properties and then show a wide range of examples from petroleum reservoirs uh, to illustrate the kinds of um, information that can be gleaned from looking at natural fractures. And they're going to move on to uh, the progress in hydraulic fracture characterization and modeling that we've seen. And then I'm going to um, look at two new applications for our group, and that would be, uh, first of all, EOR, enhanced oil recovery and CO2 storage in unconventional reservoirs, and then also a low enthalpy geothermal application. And in that application, we're using outcrop analogs and we're having to develop some new methods for fracture characterization because of challenges that uh, we've long recognized, but that uh, really need addressing. 
And then I'm going to try and pull some of the strands together at the end to show a path uh, forward for the wider group. And one of the things that I want to say is the theme of the whole talk is that projects in this space are cross disciplinary um, collaborative efforts and many of them have spanned several decades and it speaks to the difficulty of of fracture characterization. Fractures are hard and in fact my colleague Steve Laubach likes to use the term refractory to describe uh, fracture problems. So here we go. So I would say that good progress has been made um, in un better understanding controls of natural fracture patterns and attributes. And a key aspect to highlight is chemical and mechanical interaction, where cements in the fractures modify the fracture and host rock attributes. So not just the fractures themselves, but the host rock attributes as well. And those attributes can include things like length, apertures, connectivity, porosity preservation and strength. And then that thereby governs the network capacity to conduct fluids. Another thing that we can do is to use the cements to investigate when and why fractures formed and perhaps reconstruct sequential pattern development. Now, this whole concept was summarized in this publication that I've indicated down here. I've tried to um, indicate uh, many of my references because each slide pretty much could be a whole talk. So this one is a reviews of geophysics paper and it's got a, a long list of co-authors, um, but it really describes the role of chemistry in fracture pattern development. And over here on the right, um, I put this graphic from that paper and it illustrates um, one point. Um, it's captioned barren joints versus veins. So if we look at the top, we see these narrow fractures, you know, seemingly rather evenly spaced in this layered rock. And then down here, we're looking down on a bedding plane and we see a lot of fractures of different sizes, cross cutting and clustered. And so and they're filled with cement. And so the idea is that the um, cement itself can actually influence the way the fracture pattern develops. So to learn more about that, read this reference, but that's kind of an underpinning um, concept is that it's not just you've got a material and you're breaking it, it's that the material's changing with time um, and changing the mechanics with time. In part, um, one of the things that we we learned early on was that um, the influence of cement is it, it it can be predicted and it can be uh, we've made many observations and work done by Steve uh, Laubach with Rob Lander and Linda Bernal um, revealed that you could make models to predict the kinds of cement deposits that you see in fractures. So here's a picture of a fracture here photo and you see up here it's quite narrow and it's got a lot of, of material in it. That's this quartz cement and this is a sandstone and as you come down here the amount of cement reduces and it reduces and then down here you've hardly got any cement at all. And these things here are bridges of cement that go from one wall of the fracture to another. And so what we have is um, a, a kind of a pattern that we'd seen in, in our observations, and that's that small fractures can be filled and the larger ones, the ones with the wider apertures can remain open or, you know, with, even within the same fracture, the narrow tip can be filled and the larger um, main body can be open. And then you get bridges going across from one wall to another and then narrow um, deposits of um, cement on the walls that we call rinds. And we see this in, in lots of different rock types. So, you know, sandstones, carbonates, uh, basement uh, rocks, shales, all kinds of different rocks. So this cement model accounts for quartz accumulation and um, what it does is it compares the rate of quartz accumulation as the fracture opens. So it's a kind of a competition and I'm just going to play this little video to show you what's happening. So you see in the top here, this is slow opening versus fast opening down at the bottom. And you see the differences in the fact that in the slow opening, the, the 
cement can keep up somewhat, not in every place, but it can keep up in some places and it makes these bridges in a moderately fast opening. Then the cement keeps up just in this one place and it has to do with the crystallographic orientation of the quartz grains. I should have said these pale grains in this um, host rock are quartz. The darker ones are feldspar. And you note here there's nothing precipitated. See this, this blue cement and the red cement is precipitating in the host rock as well as in the fracture. But right here there's no cement and you see also right here that's because quartz doesn't like to precipitate on anything that is not quartz. And so there's a model here to explain many of the phenomena that we saw when uh, looking at these tight gas sandstones and the fractures in them. And um, the model then help to explain some of the phenomena and then you, it's a positive feedback loop because then you see things in the model and you start looking for them um, back in the, the actual rock. So that's just a couple of concepts that I wanted to introduce so that you would be um, you know, well positioned for the rest of the talk. OK, so let's give some examples of the kinds of studies that we've done over the years and um, you know, Naturally fractured reservoir characterization is a topic that's had a lot of treatment over the over the years, and this is a nice um, uh, publication by the SPE, and it's got uh, some big names in fracture research here: Wayne Nar, David Schechter, and Laird Thompson, all of whom have done uh, stellar work in in the past. And so, you know, this is not a new topic by any means, and uh, it's it's a difficult topic. So that's why it, it spans these decades. I would like to say that when we do fracture studies, the two very important things are orientation of fractures and intensity. But what I would like to say here in this talk is that the information that we can get goes beyond those two uh, parameters. And so I'm going to show some examples of fractured reservoirs in tight gas sands and dollar stones, and these are all petroleum reservoirs. And then I'm going to look at natural fractures as recorders of burial history thermal history and paleofluids, and I'm going to show uh, Barnet Shell examples. And then lastly, um, just look at natural fracture impact on unconventional reservoirs and look at vertical and pe bed parallel fractures. So let's get going and start with tight gas sands, and we're going to go to the Piance Basin and a study that we did way back in 2003. So here's Colorado and the Piance Basin, here's Utah. And we were fortunate enough to have access to the slant core from the SHCT uh, well experiment that was done. And so the SHCT well was drilled and then it comes down here through the Mesa Verde section and then into the cosette where it's a slant core in this cosette. And that's the interval that we're interested in as our tight gas sandstone. And so we have this diagram here that's a representation of the core and it's starting at 89.95 measured depth and then down to 91.05 measured depth in feet. And these little lines here represent the fractures that we can see when we examine the core um, with the naked eye and the numbers are the apertures that we measured for those fractures and some of them have um, some porosity, some of them are completely filled. So what we did was um, we plotted these uh, fracture apertures. Here's the apertures are along this scale here. This is a log scale. And then we plot cumulative frequency normalized to scanline length up here on the um, y-axis. And here are the data for the fractures from this, this core. And then we fit a, a, a line to this, which is we call it a bias model and it incorporates a power law backbone. And this was really part of an idea that we had um, when I first came to join the group, which was that perhaps you can use the uh, size distributions of microfractures to predict um, macrofractures. So here's our macrofracture ground truth. And then what we did is we looked in, in thin section and used our scanning electron microscope to image the microfractures. So if you just look in a normal thin section, you won't see these um, fractures because they're quartz filled in quartz grains and you just and they're in optical continuity and you can't see them. But with the CL, um, they stand out and you can measure their widths and collect a data set. So that's what we did here. This was one particular thin section from this location here in the core. 
and we this whole paper uh, describes the the different uh, thin sections and the, the methodologies and so on in more detail but here's just one example so here's our distribution of our microfractures if you take the power or backbone and you project it it comes pretty close to the to the micro uh, the macro fracture population and so this idea of using sealed microfractures from thin sections as guides to aperture sizes of open mi macro fractures so that remember the thin ones are all sealed but the big ones are open and they're the ones that you want to know about but you haven't always got the luxury of a slant core to to measure uh, those macro fractures so if you've just got a thin section from a from a vertical core or a sidewall core maybe you could use it to project upscale okay let's look at a fractured dollar stone now Here's um, an example. I got tasked with looking at a number of different carbonates and we focused on dollar stones um, in the beginning. And you see this one in, um, this is a Pennsylvanian dollar stone from Eddy County, it's a reservoir rock. And you see these fractures in here, some of them are pretty open. This one here shows some cement and maybe some porosity. And then there's some more over here that are open. There's some earlier structures in here, but we're gonna focus on these to start with. And then down here, we've got um, a, a different dollar stone. This is Knox from Mississippi, and we've got um, a, a nice bridge in here. This is dolomite that's growing across the fracture. And then you see all these lines here. These are um, micro fractures that have cracked this bridge over and over. And so we thought, well, maybe we could make a model just like we did with the sandstones. So we put a different set of parameters in our dollar stone model, but it's the same idea. It's a cellular automaton kind of model. It's got rule based. And so here's our, here's our bridge breaking and breaking and breaking like this one would be and yet you generate these slot like pores at the end and the replication of the model for what's what we see is is pretty good so then we thought okay okay so if you could so model this and then do a flow simulation what benefit would there be in distributing this this fracture cement in a more realistic way and so here's some models that John did with his um, student Zeno Philip and uh, uh, Jim Jennings, who was at the bureau at the time. And so in a geomechanical model, you might have a fracture system like this. So think of it like this, but this one turned on its side, this, this photo here, turn it on its side and you've got these long fractures going across, maybe some of them segmented. These ha don't have any cement in them. And then you're gonna do a flow simulation. In this one on the right, you've partly sealed some of these fractures using the knowledge that you got from the modeling. And so now when you do a flow simulation, um, say for a sweep test, then in this situation, you might think, well, it's good to have all these open fractures, but actually you get these breakthroughs and then you leave behind unswept portions of the, of the rock. Whereas when you've got this partly sealed scenario, you might have a better sweep. So the thing is you'd want to know what scenario you're dealing with if you're tr going to try and simulate flow. So that's that's an example of a study we did in the, the carbonate world. So now to go to something completely different, as they say, um, we're going to look at fracture timing from cement fill and I'm going to show some examples from Barnet shale. So if you look at this little diagram in the top left hand corner, this is a map that Steve Rupel put together. The orange is the Mississippian Barnet shale and the blue is uh, Mississippian carbonate, early Mississippian carbonate. We're going to look at a Fort Worth Basin example from a well up here in Wise County, and then we're going to go over here to Delaware Basin, um, Western Pecos County, to look at a similar effort that we did. So the Fort Worth Basin example, this is published by um, myself with uh, Marta Gasparini and William Sassi from the French Institute for Petroleum. So let me just explain what we're looking at in the middle here. This is um, a burial history diagram that has um, superimposed upon it the um, temperature that you would get in these rocks as they get buried. So along here is time with these different, I know you can't read it, but it's time here with the different formations. And then um, the Barnet shell is here. This is Mississippian time. And so it gets buried. It goes down here and then stays down for a bit and then it pops back up 
and then it stays level for the last part of its history until this over here is a representation of the rocks at present day in the well. So it's just tracking the history from when it was deposited at the surface as it goes down and then it comes back up and then it's at present day. So what we did in this well was we recognized a bunch of different fracture sets and looked at their properties and their fluid inclusion assemblages and were able to put them onto this burial history curve. So we start off this. It's hard to see, but it's an actually it's a it's a calcite filled fracture and it actually goes backwards and forwards, backwards and forwards in a series of folds. These are called tigmatic folds, the shape. And so what it suggests is that the rock was it lithified enough to take a fracture that then filled, but, but not compacted enough that then it was compacted after the fracture formed. And so we think this is early tens to hundreds of meter depth in, in burial. Um, and the sediments were not fully lithified um, when this happened. So we put it up here in the burial history near the beginning, near, near deposition. Then over here we've got calcite filled fractures and they have fluid inclusions in them in the calcite and that temperature, that at least the homo homogenization temperature comes out as 50 to 60 degrees. And so we put it here and the temperature, see this is the blue and uh, this is in the 50 to uh, 60 degree mark so it's coming down here and then we get those fractures then down here we get something completely different we get quartz filled and pyrite and when we look at the fluid inclusions in that quartz we get 90 to 100 degrees c so that's hotter so it's down here um and then we get even deeper burial and now we get calcite but we get you see on the right here this is uv um, view of the same uh, view over here and you see this all these yellow dots this is uv fluorescence of hydrocarbons and so this is deeper burial still and the precipitation is from hot fluids with a light oil 20 to 30 uh, api after um, hydrocarbon migration so over here no hydrocarbons up here no hydrocarbons this one we think is um, the quartz is coming from silica um, that's produced during smectite to illite, that's clay diagenesis. So smectite to illite transition and you generate some silica and some water when you do that. And so there's the quartz in those fractures. So it's that kind of information that can tell you something about the timing of, of hydrocarbon generation. And similarly, we did another study in the Barnet over in Delaware Basin. So we had these compacted fractures rather similar to these, although in, in detail they're different, but the early we think. And then um, these fractures what we didn't see in the Fort Worth Basin, but these are um, barite filled and they have this fibrous barite in them. And in the barite, there's these amazing um, elongate they're, they're elongate because they're parallel to the fibers of the calcite, but these are um, oil inclusions and um, there's also aqueous fluid inclusions in there and we can work out the, the timing, the temperature in just the same way as we did over here in the Fort Worth Basin. And then last but not least, we have these uh, vertical fractures, some of which have porosity. They have these bridges, these are like pillars. If you think of, you know, bridges in 3D, they're really like pillars. Um, that's what these spots are. We're looking on a fracture face there. And so you, again, you can make a burial history diagram. This one's a little bit different from that one. Here's the burial history in this dashed curve. And then the temperature is plotted on the same diagram. So the temperature is going up as the rock is going down. And here's the here's the barite coming in. And it's after the um, initial cracking of oil. Um, or, or carriage into oil conversion. And then the last fractures come in sometime over this long time period over here. So that's the example of the kinds of things that we can do. So another thing that we could do is to look at the effect of natural fractures on um, hydraulic fractures. And this was some experimental work that another student of John's did um, with, a, with a group of us that I was it, included in and he did some experiments where he's got he's looking down now on a vertical core and these white lines are calcite filled fractures this is marcellus shale so it's a vertical core it's got some vertical fractures in it we're looking down on the core and then he generated a hydraulic fracture and 
did a bunch of experiments to see what would happen when it interacted with the natural fractures. And he found that there was um, a, a really strong dependence on the angle of approach and the thickness of the natural fracture as to whether the, the, the hydraulic fracture crossed, diverted um, along like this, or arrested at, at the at the natural fracture. So those are some things that you can you can investigate um, uh, with regard to vertical fractures. They may cause diversion or arresting, or or, or they might not care at all the, the hydraulic fractures. And then over here, um, the bed parallel fractures. So a question would be: Are they barriers to hydraulic fracture height growth? So here's an outcrop of vacuum water um, in the Neerken Basin. Well, it's at the boundary of the basin in Argentina. And so this black rock is all uh, shale, the vacuum water shale. And then all these white features in here, they're all uh, bed parallel fractures filled with calcite. And if you look at them, th so there's some people over here for scale. So you see that they're quite extensive. And this is one as well going on all across here. And so this is what they look like with these fibers. And here's a scale. So, you know, three or four centimeters thick, this particular one. And you see these fibers in here and that's what they look like. So could they be barriers? What what are their properties? So I had a student, Kiki Wang, uh, for her master's. She collected data from the outcrops and then she looked at core. This is a core from the Bacam Huerta um, producer part of the Nerken Basin. And you can see all these pale things in here. These are the bed parallel fractures filled with calcite. So what she did was she, she collected data from all these different uh, sites. So we've got the field data here from the vacuum water. We've got some wells from the vacuum water and we've got the Marcellus um, up here and then one wolf camp well and plotted cumulative frequency against the aperture size. So this is for bed parallel fractures. She's divided them out over here because they have pretty different properties. So look at these squares over here that are outlined in blue. Um, this is the um, the field examples from field number one and field number two. And you see they come out here. This is 10 um, centimeters, 100 millimeters. So it's 10 centimeters thick. And that's by not the the, the, um, the thickest fracture by any means in this, uh, this outcrop um, belt. Where we were specifically, this was the widest fracture that we saw. But you see these plot together. They're pretty distinct. They have a lot of wide fractures. Up here, though, we've got these uh, diamonds that are from the wells, and actually many of them, they they end up with a similar fracture um, intensity at these kinds of scales, uh, uh, around about the one millimeter and above scale as the outcrops, but they don't have anywhere near the, the wide fractures that the outcrops had. And then there's a third group down here that has a mix of, um, there's the wolf camp in there, um, and the two Marcellus wells are sitting here, and they have a lower fracture intensity overall, a similar maximum aperture size that we see. And so, you know, there's a whole story in there that's uh, outlined in this recent publication that we did in Journal of Structural Geology. Some big take homes, um, aperture size distributions are negative exponential consistently, no power laws in here. Um, and then the bed parallel veins are located preferentially, although not exclusively, mechanical boundaries. So if you look over here, this is a tuff. We see these, these bed parallel fractures come in at the boundaries or near the boundaries of concretions and these tuff layers. And then another thing that people have looked at is the relationship with TOC content of host rock. Um, kind of saying, well, you know, generation of hydrocarbons leads to overpressure and therefore, you know, uh, the bed parallel fractures form. That's a mechanism. But on, when we looked at the relationship with TOC of the host rock, we found an inconsistent relationship. And there were reasons for that that we kind of talked about in the paper. But that's uh, another thing. So now I want to get on to um, hydraulic fractures. And so here's just a grab bag of things that I pulled out pretty randomly from the literature of 
perceptions of what hydraulic fractures look like. So we've got some trees in here. We've got a rather odd natural fracture pattern in the background uh, that's interacting with these. Over here, we've got some more trees. They're growing out laterally this time and, um, you know, branching with very wide, you know, wide dispersion of orientation. Down here, we've got uh, um, some work uh, by some people that were associated with um, PGE for a while, and um, there's looking at different um, the effects of different patterns on um, the the productive stimulated rock volume. So this is more getting more nuanced down here. And then here's Andreas M Michael. He was at the uh, PGE as a student and he's got a paper where he's talking about complexity near the wellbore and then going into dominant by wings away from the wellbore. Um, you know, there's so the, the per perception of what hydraulic fractures are like is is it's not an easy thing and, and people have different ideas. So one thing with uh, with our group, this is John's um, student and postdoc, Jia uh, Cheng Wang. He um, worked on furthering the XFRAC model that uh, John's group has created over over quite a number of years with its successive iterations as students have come through. So it's a 3D uh, model and you can have multiple input parameters. This is just one screen grab out of the uh, the model where you're modeling um, aperture size in this case is the colors and you've got a background that includes some natural fractures and the, the hydraulic fractures interacting with those. Of course, you know, there's many commercial models as well. Um, and so increasingly the goal is to try and verify the output of this kind of modeling with either micro seismic or fiber optic monitoring monitoring and what i've done is try to verify with direct observation so just taking a uh, uh, an example calculation out of the hydraulic fracture test site that i was involved with this is a uh, a situation where there had been um a, a well that's indicated by this diagram here. So there's a well in behind with the stages indicated here. There's two stages and then this is a slant well that I described. They took a core. So there's core one through four going through here and these these fracture colors are um, indicated as showing the locations of hydraulic fractures, natural fractures and natural reactivated. This is Srivastava at Al 2018 working with Mukul Sharma. Um, so they they did some um, um, work on this this project also and that this is a paper that they they had so you can refer to that I'm using this diagram just to illustrate a very simple calculation so there were 37 to 49 stages per well about 200 foot per stage three perforation clusters per stage for this particular well so that's what's shown here there's three there's two stages and there's three um, discs here indicating the clusters the perforation cluster two and a half foot with six shots per foot so if you make a big assumption and it is a big assumption that each shot creates one hydraulic fracture then you would have 45 fractures per stage and for two stages you'd have 90 fractures so there should be 90 hydraulic fractures along here but in cores one to four, we interpreted there were 324. So there's a lot more that we observed than you would predict if you made this simple assumption. So what do they look like and what are their properties? So this is uh, just some orientations. This is actually from HFTS2, just to illustrate it a little bit, um, you know, a different example. The black lines on these stereo plots are the hydraulic fractures. They show that the orientation of those is sub parallel to SH max um, with a spread of around about 40 degrees. You see that they are they have some spread, this black lines. The blue is all the natural fracture orientations, but the black is, you know, spread over this this um, range. The morphology, many of them are smooth and planar like this. Um, this is in a carbonate. It's still relatively smooth, even though the carbonate is coarse grained. But others have these segments and others are, are bifurcating. They have um, features on them that you can see. This is plumose structure. And so what we did was we, we looked at a great deal at these morphologies. We combined that with um, outcrops and with um, block models of, of gypsum and hydrostone that John um, and his students worked on in the lab 
and came up with this kind of cartoon. Again, it's a, a schematic, um, just like the first slide. This one, though, is a few centimeters to men, perhaps many tens of meters scale. So what are we looking at? OK, so here's our well. Here's a point source. We've got three fractures growing out just for the sake of this schematic. The green, the buff and the blue. So let's go through them. So the buff shows all these growth related features. So it has a plumo structure. You can see arrest lines on some of them. You can see bifurcation and you can see, uh, sorry, not bifurcation, segmentation up here and down here. The green is featureless. So sometimes the fractures just don't show anything, but then up here it partly diverts along a natural fracture um, and then goes into a bunch of small twist tackles. The blue starts off as a single fracture. You see it coming out here. It's parallel to SH max as you would expect, but then it bifurcates and the angle isn't very big, but this blue one here, I've shown it doesn't have any features. This one doesn't have any features at all, but it steps along bedding. And so that's what it looks like in map view. So the point is that even left to their own devices um, with some mechanical layering without any natural fractures necessarily, or there's one up here, these features can be quite complicated. All right, so the last part of the talk, I just want to focus on these two new um, uh, avenues of, of fracture research that we, we were interested in doing. So the first bit, I want to talk about um, approaches for producing re remaining hydrocarbons in unconventional reservoirs. And so this publication here that I just uh, found re relatively recently, it's um, on enhanced oil recovery in unconventional reservoirs, so it, it seemed to act. So, this author is saying that there's hundreds of billions of barrels that remain in place. And after 30 field trials, 15 operators, six basins in, over the last 10 to 15 years, um, they've tried to do um, EOR and the success has been variable, but there has been significant additional oil produced um, and a lot of knowledge gained. So the idea is to keep going. Projects that I've been involved in included these HFTS, the hydraulic fracture test site project. So the first one, there was actually a second project, uh, HFTS one EOR, where there was a huff and puff experiment done with produced gas. Then um, the um, HFTS two, there was great interest on the effect of previous stimulations on new pads and on parent child um, effects. And so infill drilling and um, you know influence of, of previously stimulated rock and then kind of in a different um, uh, scale or, or different goal would be uh, a trying refrax. And so HFTS3 was a, a project in the Eagle Ford, and I'm going to be able to report on that soon, hopefully, um, whereby we described the, the, the hydraulic fractures after a stimulation, and then that, was, that information was used in part to plan a, a, a refract design. And so, you know, those are the ones that I've been involved in, and this is the new one that we want to uh, develop, and that's um, CO2 storage, plus or minus EOR. It seems like the federal appetite to fund EOR comes and goes, but right now it's in. And so there's a big interest in doing EOR in um, unconventionals. So the idea, um, let's just look at this diagram over here. This is from Sheng Peng, who's one of my colleagues who's on this, this paper, this uh, talk as a co-author. He published a paper in Ertec in this year, and this little diagram just illustrates the difference between what I would call conventional CO2 storage. So you've got a well and you pump CO2 down and it creates a plume and you just need to make sure it's confined and doesn't come back out again as opposed to unconventionals where you've got a different scenario. You've got a well with its hydraulic fracture treatment and it's there's some pressure cavity developed during production of hydrocarbons and then you might pump CO2 in and um, try to store it in this pressure cavity. And so the idea is to use depleted oil and gas wells in shales. Um, and of course, the hydraulic and natural fractures potentially provide pathways for CO2 injection, but they also pose the risk because of leakage. And what we're interested in doing is to um, take a look at 
various parameters, including the, the kind of um, network that you might have, but also just basic information like fracture intensity. So P32, we call it fracture surface area divided by rock volume um, and get an idea of what this might be so that you can do better uh, storage capacity calculations because that's going to be necessary to to even figure out whether this is a viable thing to do at all um, to provide better DFN models for numerical simulation and of course we need to know um, about the fracture system because if we do CO2 storage we're going to have to monitor um, what's happening to that CO2. And so just some back of the envelope calculations if you just take um, the, the core numbers that we got for HFTS1 and HFTS2, we end up with these P32 numbers. They're in the right ballpark, well, not the right, the, the same ballpark as natural fracture systems, actually, um, uh, about, you know, uh, one to two uh, per metre um, in this measure. And of course, you know, it's an average estimate for the particular location of the cores in those experiments. So there's going to be a lot of heterogeneity in P32, but th those were the average numbers that we came up with. And so to the last example, um, we're going to talk about low enthalpy um, geothermal in sedimentary basins. This is a project that uh, my colleague Steve Larbach has been involved in. It's at Cornell University and it's called CUBO, the Cornell University Borehole Observatory Geothermal Project. And the idea is to use hot water for campus heating. And there's a variety of different um, potential targets, including sandstones, carbonates and basement. But one of them that's um, proving to be interesting is the Potsdam sandstone. And so what we have is the Cubo um, location here on the uh, um, Ithaca campus and then the Potsdam outcrops in upstate New York. And so we've been able to do a sidewall core analysis and an outcrop analog study. And you know, here's the, here's the side of the, of the well and then there's a little um, news article about it and it says that the initial data appears to confirm the prior expectations. We've got depths between 7,500 and 10,000 feet, rock temperatures between 75 and 100 Celsius, and little permeability except that controlled by ancient fractures in the rock. In other words, you need to know about the fracture systems, especially if you're going to then um, need an enhanced geothermal system um, for, the, for the whole thing to work. So, what we've done is to go for these outcrop analogs and you see this is a pavement of uh, Potsdam sandstone and you see all these fractures in here so you can collect a lot of information for these opening mode fractures, number of sets, orientations, all these attributes down here, the porosity, cement structure and mechanical and fracture stratigraphy and that's all very well but and I've got this big red box here, the outcrops that you're going to take all this data from must have shared structural diagenetic attributes with the subsurface to be useful analogs. You can't just take any old outcrop and, and imagine that it's any way representative of what's going in the subsurface. So what we've done is to check the outcrop samples against the, the core and sidewall cores for shared attributes. And it turns out that these are in fact are pretty good um, analogs. What you can actually do, though, if you really understand how those systems develop is you can do this. You can extrapolate to areas having different thermal histories. So if you understand the way that the fractures grow, the cements come in and modify the, the attributes, then you, you, you can actually deal with um, areas having different thermal histories. In collecting the data, off those outcrops, we come up against a couple of really difficult thorny, thorny problems, one of which is length, and that's long been a bugbear. So let's look at this fracture here uh, outlined in yellow. So, you know, you could draw a long trace here from blue dot to blue dot. So blue dots um, are this I node, which is the, um, the end of a fracture. You could draw that in and link that and measure that as a length or you could look more closely and say oh hold on a minute there's a lot of little segments in here and similarly for this little box down here blown it up you know here's a series of segments now do you join them up and measure them as one or do you um, separate them out 
And that's a, a difficult question. And so Stephanie Forstner, who's a student in our group, together with Steve, her supervisor, have developed these um, uh, scale dependent um, methods or, or rather uh, scale sensitive methods to decide what you do in this situation. And they call this contingent nodes or C nodes. And that adds to the, you know, the, the N's, the, the Y nodes and the X nodes that have been described in other fracture studies uh, for quite some time. Um, but they've added these contingent nodes. And what that means is you, you decide whether you're going to join it up or not, depending on what you know about the way that those um, crossovers or those uh, offsets, those on echelon overlaps work. So if there's some at, a, at a, a small scale, there's actually some linkage in there, you might decide that you're going to count it as one. If there's no linkage at all, you might decide you're going to count them as, as separate. And so you, you, it's a rule based criterion and it has to be developed as you go along. So that's the length. And then the other difficult thing is spatial organization. And um, I'm just going to say that, you know, here's two uh, populations of spacing represented in 1D. And so the, the vertical bars are representing fractures and we've scattered them in a random distribution up here. But the spaces of the two examples are identical. They've just been rearranged. So here you've got all the spaces the small space is clustered in two centers, whereas up here they're distributed. And so you see that you get a very different um, distribution, even though the actual spacings are the same for that population. And so bottom line is that the spatial organization is challenging to quantify. And, um, you know, the mechanism of fracturing is is often poorly constrained in models or even worse assumed. So fracture spacing may not be associated with major structures. A thing called structural curvature that people have used um, may not be useful and forward models or strain may not help. And so, you know, outcrops may or may not be good analogs. We've decided in the Potsdam case they are. Um, but populating a realistic DFN, a di discrete fracture network, I should say, is difficult. So uh, two students working almost simultaneously with different groups um, have worked up uh, methods to address this. So this is Rodrigo Correa. He's using a thing called the normalized correlation count, which is a two point uh, correlation integral method. And um, he's developed that from 1D into 2D. So this is a map and these red lines are fractures. And what he does is he puts the central point of the fractures on here and then analyzes these in, in this with this uh, two point correl correlation integral method called correlation count and um, comes up with these plots over here that I'm not going to go into. But basically you can compare the data, which is this line here or the red or the green using different um, ways of, of analyzing the data and compare it to a randomized um, distribution. So this one up here falls right in the middle. This is unweighted and you would say it's indistinguishable from random, whereas these pop up in certain length scales away from the randomized distribution. So they have um, some signal in there. And then simultaneously, Mahmoud Shakiba working with Larry Lake and, and mainly Michael Perch um, in, in PGE, they worked on a similar um, method, but it's actually uh, a slightly different. Uh, it's Ripley's K function. It's related to uh, uh, correlation count. It's actually more related to correlation sum. But um, but what Mahmoud did in this recent paper in marine and petroleum geology was um, map out not only the midpoints, which is the Barry centers that Rodrigo used, but he also looked at Y nodes, X nodes and I nodes as well and came up with these different um, you know, plots that you can then interrogate the spatial organization. And so the goal is to better understand the spatial organization of fracture systems so that you can make more realistic uh, discrete fracture network models. So the last slide here is to say this is the kind of path forward. Um, this is a couple of uh, this is a slide that John and uh, Steve Larbach put together a couple of years ago. And so what it's doing is it's saying you've got a geomechanical model, 
of fractures that has real apertures in there, you can put cement in. What if you could actually put cement in at specific places using the lander cement growth model that I described earlier? So that then you can actually figure out what kind of distribution of fractures you've got and which ones are open, which ones are closed and so on. You can make the, the geomechanics and the diagenesis work together in the same model. And so John now has a couple of students who are working this problem, um, focusing a lot on um, the Potsdam outcrop um, examples. And so I will let them tell their own story uh, at, at an appropriate point that they were going to present their work. And um, but suffice to say that they're moving this whole concept of how to do things along. And so to conclude then, um, I would say fractures are of major importance in all energy projects, both uh, um, petroleum um, reservoirs and then some of the new ventures in, in different kinds of energy. Natural fracture system characterization um, relies on carefully selected outcrops combined with core studies and the recognition that chemical and mechanical interactions govern natural fracture properties. I would say hydraulic fracture characterization, modeling and monitoring has advanced. There's still a lot to do, but we are moving in the right direction of really understanding this um, um, method better. And then I showed a couple of examples of some new projects, uh, fracture characterization needed for EOR and CO2 pro storage projects in unconventionals, and then uh, permeability assessment in low, enthal low enthalpy geothermal, where improved spatial analysis and connectivity methods um, and advanced modeling um, is needed that incorporates mechanics and diagenesis. And so with that, I'm just going to put up my acknowledgement slide and um, these are some of the references um, if you need to get at those. And uh, I will um, wrap up there um, from Attila. It says, are the bed parallel or the BPV fractures purely extensional or do you see shearing hybrid kinematics along them and how do they relate to the far field stress field? Yeah, so first of all, um, so that they're, they're bed parallel. And so that immediately creates a, a problem and people have talked about this in the past. I'll try and make my answer reasonably brief. There's actually a lot of argument and back and forth about the mechanism for generating bed parallel fractures because the geochemistry would say that these are developing fairly deep down in the reservoir um, in the in the in the basin and they're to do often with hydrocarbon generation so that they're, they're, they're deep. And so in that case, the vertical stress is pretty high and you shouldn't be able to just open things up against the vertical stress like that. Fractures should be vertical and well behaved parallel to SH max, you know, and, and that should be how it is. So um, some people have proposed different mechanisms wh whereby that might happen and I'm, I'm not going to go into it, but it, um, there's things called um, seepage um, forces. There's um, generation of um, uh, uh, elastic complexities at the point of, of um, conversion of uh, kerogen to hydrocarbons. So momentary kind of changes in stress field. There's, there's a lot of different um, attempts to answer that question. And then um, Peter Cobble came along and just said, look, you know, honestly, the simplest answer is just that when these are happening, in many, many cases, there is um, a compressional tectonic regime. And so vertical stress is, is not the maximum stress. And in fact, it's one of the horizontal stresses. And so therefore, you know, you can e open these things up easily. For the most part, that seems to be the case. And we do see um, evidence. I, I don't, I, I, I stop sharing my slides, but if you did see that example where I did show the fibrous example of the bed parallel vein, those of you who are really looking might have seen that the fibers were not normal to the vein and we see many um, situ situations where we get an early opening where fibers are normal to the to the vein wall and then they go oblique to indicate shearing and then there's um, a whole bunch of weird little kinematic indicators that we discovered in the beef themselves that have to do with 
um, shortening mechanisms. And S.T. Ukar wrote a whole paper about that um, in Journal of Structural Geology, um, kinematic indicators in, in, in beef. And so, yes, so the answer, the second part is yes, we do see shearing um, and there's, we can pass it out to different phases. We can look at the fluid inclusions to determine when the shearing was happening. And, and so that's hopefully an answer to the question there. It says great example of the complexity downhole, i.e. 320 foot for real, and he's talking about hydraulic fractures versus 90 hydraulic fractures as assumed. Would you care to speculate why all our super duper all singing and coupled dancing frat geomechanics simulators cannot ever get this degree of complexity? At best, when forced, they will propagate 90 fracs, but more often it would be even less than a fracture at each perf. This is a battle we continuously have internally when trying to explain why field reality and performance isn't matching models. Uh, I cannot answer the question. It says, would I care to speculate? I would say that, you know, people fall back on the idea. Let me just publish this. Um, people fall back on the idea that um, all models are useful, um, all models are wrong, but some are useful. Um, that's a, a trite way of, of, of answering that question, I suppose, to say that um, the heterogeneity perhaps in the host rock that influences subtle changes in direction, um, behavior, segmentation, bifurcation behaviors that you see in the core um, that they can't be captured oftentimes in geomechanical models. Um, and so, you know, there's a, an oversimplification of the material that the fractures are growing in. And that's hard to get away from. And you could make a small scale model where you increase the heterogeneity at a very small, you know, scale, say a few centimeters or something. But then how do you upscale that? It's, it's a really, really hard problem to do. Um, so that's all I'm going to say because I'm not a modeler. I mean, maybe John would would care to jump in on that, but since he's the the host, he's denying <laughs> that opportunity, which I don't blame him. But um, okay, so that's the best I can do. It's hard. Um, I think the more that we get into 3D modeling and um, open up different um, visual impressions of what hydraulic fractures are like the more that modelers might be able to um, better decide what uh, start materials they have in their models and how they're going to handle those. Um, yeah, it's a, it's a hard problem. OK, so next question is um, back from Attila again. Do you see some systematic variation in hydraulic fracture geometry? Can you predict certain geometry of these fractures or are they the result of more complex interplay between or of SH max, mechanical stratigraphy, pre-existing fracts, et cetera? Um, I'm going to publish that and then try and answer it. I would say that um, we have not done enough work on that data set to figure out whether we could have predicted it. You know, to draw an analogy, I have often been on outcrops where there's a layered, say, carbonate, and you'll see a different fracture pattern in each layer. And you could have a student work on that for three years and figure out why the fracture patterns are different in each layer. And they would come away perhaps with a good answer. But the problem was, could you have predicted it ahead of time? And unless you know enough, to explain the myriad examples of when when that might happen, it would be very hard to predict it. And maybe you could, maybe you couldn't. I don't know. Um, so that's the best I can do with that. How can we calculate the actual permeability from the fractures and shale matrix permeability? Um, yeah, that's a good question. And it's difficult because um, when you get, so he's saying, how can you calculate that? I'm not sure that you would uh, be able to calculate it. Make, well, you could have a stab at it. I know in terms of measuring matrix permeability in shale, it's hard. And our um, organization has um, a, a group 
run by Peter Flemings that does uh, experiments on that. And they came up with a method to measure permeability in shale that was pretty convincing to me in that if you take a shale sample, it's come up from the deep subsurface and it's got all kinds of stress release effects in that sample. And what they did was they cycled stress to close those back down and then measured permeability in their lab and came up with, with numbers that seemed to be reasonably sensible and reproducible. So that's the best I could do with that. So, I'd, so calculating the permeability, of course, it depends where your fractures are um, and what scale you're looking at, because the permeability is going to be different at different scales. So that's that's another tough nut to crack. Thank you all for, for coming and listening to the presentation and uh, hopefully um, are convinced that fractures are important in all these these different avenues. OK, thank you all for uh, attending this Center for Subsurface Energy and the Environment webinar. Um, and thank you very much to Julia for a very interesting talk. I always think um, sitting around listening about fractures for an hour is always time well spent. So um, we're about to wrap up. I will mention one informational thing on one of the questions the court asking about Cornell University that that site is directly under the campus that they're doing the the uh, geothermal um, production from the outcrops are far away that we were studying. Yeah, so, um, but that's just a quick informational thing. So thank you all very much for your time and we will see you um, in December and January um, for our next second Tuesday of the month talks.